Welcome everyone to the Single with a Taxia session. My name is Lori Shogren and I am the Community Program and Services Director for the National Ataxia Foundation assisting with this session. So before we get underway with introducing our speakers, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping notes. Please remember to ask questions at any time. We'll have our speakers available after the presentation to answer those questions. We'll have a short survey at the end of the session and would appreciate if you could just take a minute and give us that feedback. Also, if you are missing one of the talks happening at the same time as this one, don't worry. We'll have all the sessions available for on-demand viewing at the end of the day. So click the videos on demand link on the side of your navigation of the event platform. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. First off, we have Kyle Bryant, who's the Ride a Taxi of Founder and Director. is He's an athlete, a speaker, an advocate, and he's also the director of Ride a Taxi. Kyle was diagnosed with FA at the age of 17 and has since started one of the most successful campaigns for FA research, Ride a Taxi. And it is a co host for the popular podcast series, Two Disabled Dudes. He's completed num numerous long distance bike rides and has participated in a variety of forums as an advocate for persons with ataxia and treatment development. We also have Carly Hansen, who is a 38 year old mom that lives in Northwest Indiana. She enjoys fighting the social norm by staying happily single. Her interests include travel, having fun with her kids, and becoming more of an ambassador for this rare disease. Finally, we have Courtney Ng. Courtney organizes programming for Hope for Ataxia and is an active community member, trying to raise ataxia awareness. In her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her family, discussing all things movies and keeping active with walking and aquafit. Courtney has ARCA-1 and lives in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. All right, guys, take it away. When I think of the topic single with ataxia, I immediately think of dating apps. I think about filling out my profile. What should I say about myself? Not too much, not too little. Okay, I have five photos. Should the first one show my wheelchair or just a headshot? Should I show my wheelchair at all? After I message with someone for a bit, when should I tell them about Friedrich's ataxia? Should I wait until we meet? Jeez, just thinking about this topic makes my palms sweat. So I was watching the first season of Fargo. It's that series that's based on the movie. And there's a hitman, a hired assassin played by Billy Bob Thornton. And he's sitting across the table from one of the main characters, Lester. And he says, your problem is that you've spent your whole life thinking there are rules. There aren't. His point stuck with me. We seem to think that we're supposed to find someone of the opposite sex, get married at around 25, have kids at around 30, buy a house, get a dog, and live happily ever after. Those are the rules. We've all dreamt of that scenario. However, how many people can we think of that have that story? Okay, fine. I can think of quite a few, but I would say it's definitely not a majority of the people I know. Many people I know were not planning on dealing with rare disease in their lives, but here we are. Mike Tyson said, Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. 
Now, I would not call Mike Tyson a great philosopher, but his quote relates to many situations in life. Life is not about what happens to us. Life is about how we react. When living with ataxia, I know many of you watching have realized that no matter how much we'd love it, if there were rules to follow, that's not the case. There are no rules. We're making up our own all the time. In fact, I think the most beautiful and useful and comforting thing about the ataxia community is that we all help each other make up the rules. In a community like this, you can look around and take cues from others that help you establish a set of rules and principles for your life. When you realize there are no rules and you get to make them up on your own, you begin to notice the way someone else with the ataxia exercises or does laundry or the wheelchair they have that allows them to get things done and you let those things inform the way you do stuff or approach life. It works the other way too. Some things that work for others will not work for you. And that realization is just as valuable. And it's informed by interactions with community members too. I know many of you know what a super pole is. I would never have two of them in my home if it weren't for my friend, Sam Bridgman. I also love my Will Model CI, and I first found out about it through my friend, Abby England. Hand controls, shoes, home modifications, and the list goes on. These are all things that make life better and they're all in my life because of the ataxia community. When I was first asked to be on this panel titled Single with Ataxia, I was intimidated because I'm the last person you want dating and relationship advice from, trust me. But through a conversation with the other panelists, I realized that being single with a taxi is not about being in a romantic relationship. It's not even about a taxi. It's about being comfortable in your own skin. It's about the realization that there are no rules and you get to make up your own with the help of others who care about you and who are going through the same thing. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this panel and I look forward to your questions. Hi, thanks C and the F for having me. My name is Carly Hansen and I live in Northwest Indiana with my two kids, Tegan, age 12 and Oliver is nine. I was married the same year I was diagnosed and was nowhere near the right frame of mind to be making such a huge decision. I was married for six years and have been divorced for six years now. I felt the front. I have found that you have to be your best self before you even think about dating. I always thought that after I found my other half, I'd be happy and complete, but you have to start off that way. You basically have to be completely settled into your singleness before the right person will appear. It's impurating and a lot of work. In the normal day-to-day -day life, I'm a mom. I'm kept really busy with e-learning, sporting events, and a lot of chauffeuring. I also read, take myself out for dinner, play my music too loud, and try to work out. I've recently read a lot of self-help books. 
My favorite self-help author is Mark Manson. He's sort of the bad boy of self-help. He makes you ask yourself questions as society has already approved as normal with well-researched and logical thought and lots of swearing. He stresses that there is no right or wrong and that you act the best way you can with the tools and knowledge you have at that moment. I've enjoyed being part of adaptive recreational activities. I've been skiing, sailing, rock climbing, and most recently, scuba diving. I love these groups because the volunteers you are interacting with expect you to be disabled. So you fast forward through the awkwardness of meeting new people. It's easy to build trust really fast when you are literally putting your life in someone else's hands. One year ago with my first open water adaptive dive, the people I met there are still friends and I can easily call them for anything. I also have a long haired chihuahua named Peppa. I love having a dog. It's a constant companion and a good reason to take a walk. It also gives me a chance to think about someone other than myself meeting new people. She gives them something to focus on besides my disability. The dog likes she can't be that bad, right? Isolation is very easy. Leaving the house is not only physically difficult, but dealing with strangers can be emotionally exhausting. I want you to challenge the fear of going out by asking what is the worst thing that could happen. But you also have to ask what is the best thing that could happen. What else is stopping you from going after what you really want? I'm horrible about keeping up with people socially. I don't want to bother people. I've learned and always forget that the people that want to spend time with you don't mind accommodating a special need. It doesn't bother them to be able to spend time with the person they enjoy. At the same time, a person that makes you feel like you are always a burden isn't worth wasting your time with. Society is built to be disabling, but you are supposed to ask for help, and good people will help. It's just human nature to need one another. Finding your support group does not mean finding one person. There are many sides to a person, and thinking that one person will meet your every need is unrealistic. Some people bring out your silly side. Others can bring out your thoughtful side. Someone that personally deals with the same or similar disability. In my case, someone that understands parenting or even someone that you can just sit in silence with and be comfortable. You have something in common with everyone and it's up to you to decide if you wish to find it or not. You show people how to treat you by how you treat yourself and how you allow others to treat you. Take a moment to be proud of yourself because you've been through a lot and chose to continue on. The body that has caused you so much trouble is the same one that has gotten you through everything so far. That is an accomplishment and you should be proud. Radical self-acceptance is necessary and a lot easier said than done. It's so easy to be ashamed that you don't move or act or look like everyone else. And it took me until this year to look at myself and say, this is how I move and how I speak. And not only is it okay, but it's beautiful. Being able to communicate what you need and what you expect is common for every relationship. But with a rare condition, things cannot be assumed or expected. 
I keep certain things out of place or place them in weird ways because I've found that to be the easiest way to live with those things. The same could be said for preferences regarding transfers. Do we prefer to have your disability addressed when it is or is not appropriate to provide help? One of the things I learned from my scoop diving group is that good people want this information, but aren't sure how to ask. It's a great and safe place to practice communicating in a group like this. On my trip, a volunteer asked, is it okay to ask if you want help? It's an eye-opening experience that people want to go out of their way to make sure that ours okay. He also wanted to know how to ask and common ways to help. There are good people that mean well. On this same trip, another volunteer set up a transfer in the hardest way possible. And I jokingly asked, what are you doing? We all laughed and then I told him how he preferred to transfer and why. And I made sure he also knew he could ask how I wanted to be helped instead of just assuming he knew best. We are all learning and we have to try to be patient and understanding. Activities for dating. What do you like to do? Do that. You like to read? Meet at a bookstore or the library. You like to go out on a trail? Meet them there. Do whatever you're comfortable with in a place where you can be confident. The place is not the place is not as important as your confidence. As far as intimacy goes, pick a good one, talk about everything, have fun and laugh a lot. I really want you to go after whatever you want. The purpose of life is to try, try and then fail, try and then change your mind, try and then try again. And to quote Mark Manson, to find your ideal partner, you must first work on becoming your ideal self. Thank you. Thank you to the National Ataxia Foundation for allowing me to share my story of being single with ataxia. So some background on me. I'm 30 years old from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and I have ARCA1, which is autosomal recessive cerebellar ataxia type 1. So I was diagnosed 25, and it was very impactful time for me because those were the formative years of my life. I thought I was in the prime of my life. I was trying to make long-term plans. I was trying to find a career. I was trying to find a long-term partner. Really, I was defining who I was and what my purpose was in this world. And it was really tough for me at that time because I was just in denial. I didn't believe that I had anything different. I felt my diagnosis was in other and it wasn't part of me. And it was really an isolating period because I had no one to talk to and nowhere to turn. I saw all my friends getting married, moving out, moving forward with their lives, but I wasn't. I felt stuck. I felt left behind. So because of this, I felt an urgency to date and to find what everyone else had. So in response to feeling both different and having my, this diagnosis and not reaching the same milestones as others, I went on a bunch of dates and these dating apps to find what everyone else had. And it was tough for me to date with Daxia. 
there was anxiety of disclosing. Should I tell them right off the bat? Should I wait? Would they stay or would they leave because of my condition? I was always concerned and nervous if someone would notice my speech, my imbalance, my white stance. Every time anyone made a comment about any of these things, I would brush it off and make myself the butt of a joke. Honestly, I tried to hide it as best I could. Once I went on this date and I fell and knocked over the next table's glasses. Water was everywhere. Sure, my knee hurt, but it was more of a blow to my ego. My date helped me up and I went home. And the next morning, I woke up to a large bruise and I didn't hear from this person again. And although I knew that sometimes these things just weren't a match, I couldn't help but wonder if on some degree, my fall contributed to the end of the courtship. So I went on more of these dates and I left them feeling isolated and unfulfilled. And I really didn't know why. And these dates didn't progress because I subconsciously feared that someone else would legitimize the rejection I had of myself. So I was frustrated that I couldn't find what I wanted on these dates. I was always looking for confidence, meaning and acceptance from others, but I realized it was something I had to find within myself. Not accepting my condition was a barrier for me when dating. I didn't accept myself, so I was looking for someone else to accept me. I was always thinking, okay, when I did accept my condition, maybe things would change. And so when I did start to accept it over time, I went online to see what supports there were. And through them, I found support groups. And I was able to find the companionship that I wanted in a relationship. The supportive communities were so helpful because they provided me a safe haven for me to express my feelings and challenges without judgment. Like, when someone talked about having an invisible illness. It was cathartic. I'd never met any of these people, but I instantly felt heard and seen. Now, I run, I help run a virtual support group on a regular basis with Hope for Ataxia, and I'm so grateful for it because it can be isolating to be single with Ataxia. They've provided me a sense of community and comfort that I couldn't find elsewhere. Since I rejected that part of myself for such a long time, I thought I was limited in what I could do. I thought I had finite options available to me based on my condition. I was afraid to try new activities like swimming or traveling abroad. But once I did these things, I knew it was possible. I knew there were more doors waiting to be opened. So I think we're all capable of doing of more than we thought possible. I don't feel stuck or as left behind as I once did. I know that the choices I make can affect the trajectory of my life and those choices are endless. My journey is not done and my story is ever evolving. I still have ups and downs, but I realize that everyone has their own timelines. Acceptance is a deeply personal journey and it comes from within. Thank you and I look forward to your questions.